Unger the Radar, bringing movies and people together, one frame at a time. Hey guys, I'm Randy Unger, and this is another episode of Unger the Radar, bringing movies and people together, one frame at a time. And with me tonight, back for more, we have Miss Ivy Lofberg. Hey Ivy, how's it going? Hey Randy, happy to be here. Good to see you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of our Matthew Broderick discussion tonight. Basically, two films that he did, uh, one from 1983. Uh, basically, tonight will be uh, Matthew Broderick versus Machines and versus Monsters. So the first film we'll be reviewing is uh, the the classic techno thriller War Games from 1983, celebrating its 40th anniversary. Uh, a fantastic film, uh, early role, actually Matthew's second film ever, fantastic. Uh, and it's just a really exciting uh, story of a computer hacker, a a a basically a teenage student, high school student, who unwittingly hacks into the, uh, the NORAD uh, computer system and basically almost triggers World War III. Fantastic film, um, I, I love it, huge fan. Uh, we're also gonna talk about a film he did uh, 15 years later, uh, though not as well received. Uh, it is the reboot of Godzilla from 1998. And in this, he also plays a kind of a nerdy guy. Uh, in this one, basically, he's the, the expert who must try and figure out how to stop Godzilla, who has returned uh, actually has, has arrived in Manhattan only to wreak havoc and uh, release its spawn into onto the world. And um, we're going to talk about those two very different films uh, starring Matthew. But first, uh, I want to welcome Ivy. Uh, Ivy, it's good to see you again. We had a great time last last episode with John Landis. And um, yeah, this I think this is going to be a fun one as well. <laughs> But um, before we get into Matthew Broderick's filmography here a bit, uh, I just want to mention that yesterday I had the uh, privilege and honor of attending a very special event that happens every so often. Uh, it is called Spoons, Tunes, and Booze, and it is a very, very silly, very fun event that takes place at the uh, Nighthawk Cinema primarily. Uh, and if it, those who don't know about Spoons, Tunes, and Booze, it basically is um, they show old school cartoons uh, from like the 80s and 90s when we were kids. And they have a cereal buffet, uh, basically a table set up with all the cereals you can think of, all the cereals you had when you were a kid, and basically try to replicate your childhood, your your Saturday mornings as a kid. And it's just a great, great event. Uh, I'm going to be going a lot more in the coming months. And I just wanted to um, share that with you. Secret Formula is the company that's in charge of it. And they do some great stuff. If you just go to their website, uh, you can see their calendar. So some really good stuff. Ivy, I hope to see you there uh, in the near future. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, um, my birthday is the, um, on the 20th. And Randy just told me that there it's going to be on the 21st and the 22nd. So I'm definitely going to be there one of those days with my crew <laughs> to celebrate the birthday. So I hope to see you guys there. Yeah, and and... Bring your costumes because it is going to be uh, a Halloween themed event. So, yeah, uh, I may or may not be going as a Ghostbuster. We shall see. Uh, still have a, a few weeks, about two weeks to uh, plan that. But um, enough of uh, that stuff. Let's get into Matthew Broderick. So, uh, you know, obviously he is best known for playing the 80s uh, slacker slash hero Ferris Bueller and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That's how I discovered him. Uh, when I was a kid, he was my idol. I wanted to to be on that float. I wanted to sing, twist, and shout. I wanted to drive that Ferrari. And he was just such a cool uh, role model and icon, really. And um, I think, yeah, that is definitely his most well-known role. Uh, Ivy, what do you think of uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? <laughs> I agree. I, I feel like 95% of my personality was created from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> I just am. So um, that's a movie I feel like that uh, formed so much of my life. And um, I actually wrote an article for Film Inquiry. It was um, the Zen of Ferris Bueller. 
and um, just uh, talk. I completely agree. Just his attitude towards life felt very familiar. Like he just had such a joyful, he was joyfully mischievous in a really smart way. Like I love when he's like, you know, how how could you have the high school at a on a day like this and he just went out and just lived you know he just was I think one of the John Hughes movies where um he's really the opposite I loved all of the John Hughes movies a lot and what I loved about Ferris is he just actually had no angst he just was like (laughs) enjoying life and enjoying the opportunities in a way that like nobody ever really got hurt from ditching school a couple of days you know so I I just felt he his free spirit was such a great role model I felt like for to like counterbalance the intensity I feel like of being a teenager yeah for sure like if if I were uh if I was you know playing hooky from school I would just sleep in but he I'm, (laughs) I'm pretty sure he woke up like (laughs) <laughs> at the crack of dawn and he had this all planned out like the museum the parade the baseball game the museum the uh the fancy restaurant <laughs> lunch like this was this had to have been planned i mean i'm assuming I, or maybe he just did it he totally improvised it but it it made for some fantastic cinema and uh definitely without a doubt one of john hughes very best films for sure so for sure and i i i feel too like matthew kind of was the first of a a certain kind of lead character where it feels when i watched uh some of matthew broderick again i recognized like michael cera a little bit like this kind of um you know he he really was so funny in such a easygoing kind of way he just really um wasn't out to um really cause any harm really in the world but he wasn't afraid to kind of break the rules a little bit but it, I, in a way that kind of just brought more happiness to the people around him and I thought that was really amazing um about Ferris and what Matthew brought to it like everybody who went along with him on that day had a huge breakthrough in their yeah. life. You know, Cameron has this huge breakthrough. His sister has this huge breakthrough and everyone who tried to bring him down just an, uh, hit bad luck after bad luck. And that's what I love about that movie so much is like everybody around him was always made better by what he was doing, you know, and um, he was following out of this kind of whimsical path through life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like many John Hughes films, there are a lot of revelations, a lot of character arcs and uh, changes within each character. And uh, that's, you know, quintessential John Hughes, uh, breakfast club, pretty in pink, um, you know, etc. cetera. So yeah, he, he, he did not have angst. I agree with that. No angst. And he basically just wanted to elevate those that he cared about. And, um, those that wanted to ring him down, they, they failed miserably. Like, uh, <laughs> like Jeffrey Jones character. Like he's, he, t- he totally broke him. He broke him as a man. Um, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, I also want to mention, um, I believe Matthew Broderick was in the running to play Marty McFly. And uh, yeah, I think that would have been an interesting uh, take on on the character. Because also, Michael J. Fox, as a kid, Michael J. Fox was another idol of mine. So, and very, Marty McFly and, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, that, that would be like an interesting bout between those two yeah. characters. Because they're both very similar they're both kind of like these teenage uh, champions of freedom and they're just out to have a good time, you know, and well, Marty McFly doesn't really know what he's, what he's doing most of the time, but uh, he, he, he makes up for it. But Matthew Broderick's finest performance, I'd say is Ferris Bueller. For sure. <laughs> now. Absolutely. And I, I love that, that mashup of uh, Marty McFly and Matt and Ferris. I, I think they would have been good friends had they yeah. met. Or horrible, horrible enemies. Yeah. (laughs) 
I could definitely no. see that too. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would pay good money to see that that movie. <laughs> Ferris <laughs> versus Marty. I love it. Um so with War Games, 1983, um, you know, his second film, Roderick all he plays kind of this nerdy guy, but highly intelligent. Uh, I mentioned he does hack into the uh, the military's computer, and it's crazy how how scary this movie is, but how well made it is. You know, this was during the Cold War, and uh, you know tensions were very high, and tensions are still high uh, with the Soviet Union. You know, so it's yeah, he he almost starts World War Three, and he, throughout the movie, he doesn't even realize what he's doing, like the gravity of the situation. <laughs> It takes a uh, Dabney Coleman, who plays like a military uh, official over at the um, the NORAD um, center, and he's under custody. And yeah, I I love the whole DEFCON five, how it goes down to DEFCON four, and, and yeah, we don't want to see it go down any lower. But yeah, great movie, really tense, but at the same time, really fun. Like it's a, it's a really you know it, it's very briskly paced. So it's a nice little thriller. Um, and even the the film score is a little lighthearted to kind of bring, uh, you know, levity to the whole situation. You've also got um, Ali Sheedy as kind of the ditzy love interest. And also uh, Matthew's character is David Lickman. Uh, his parents in, in, in the film are also kind of oblivious to what's going on. But... I don't know. I I rewatched it the other day and it holds up, you know, it's 40 years old, but it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like the, what's possible out there, you know? And um, I think this is one of, uh, this is definitely one of the, the best thrillers to come out of the eighties and definitely one of Matthew's uh, finest performances. Ivy, what do you think of uh, war games? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's really a film that is a, truly a classic. You could watch it now and I feel like it's a movie that could come out now and still be as great as it was then it is so well made and it's really incredibly written and I feel like in that movie every scene really makes sense like there's nothing that ever feels um like filler in the in war games and it also it's amazing how it was one of the first um of uh, like a hacker mm -hmm. um and i've i've heard a lot that a lot of kids who like work for google now and have become really in their whole life in the tech world say it's because of war games like it be, that was their bible they watched it and they were like oh my gosh like David is me and they like saw themselves in him and like based their full life choices on what um, they saw in that movie. And I think it, it was an incredibly powerful film too. And that I, I feel like a lot of the films of like that, that come out now are a little bit more jaded. Like the main character feels like he's kind of a darker figure who kind of wants to bring down um you know civilization and, and kind of wants to do harm and it kind of is a little bit like I just watched Heathers and the Christian Slater in there who kind of is the anarchist that wants to kind of blow up the school but I love that Matthew didn't know what he was doing it, he really has a likeness to him and oh I a spirit of play and he's just kind of messing around and is seeing what he can do. He has a real lightheartedness to him. And I, I think what's so brilliant about that movie is him like just playing in that way ends up um, having a, a profound effect on the world. And I think um, Ferris Bueller is a little bit um, like that in that way as well. Like there, you know, in war games, David is just uh, seeing how far this new toy he has can go. And he wants to also, I think, impress this girl that he likes. And he's just a teenager who is really interested in the world and really interested in this new technology. And you know, like he um, wants to just have fun in the world and see what 
what it's all about out there in the world and yeah that's uh, and yeah. no that's it he, he just wants to like mess around he doesn't want to commit a felony here he just wants to have a bit of lighthearted fun with technology and it gets him into some really hot water you know he wants to book a, a trip to paris with ali sheedy which is hilarious I, there's a, a, a great scene um later on when uh david is in custody and dad becomes like who are you going to paris with <laughs> and he's like oh yeah but um it's like it's just like a really like it's really heavy stuff obviously you know world war th the, the threat of world war three but it, it's done in a very kind of almost lighthearted manner um you know i i mentioned the score being very goofy and, and lighthearted as well um this it, i don't know this movie um for me, anyway, it, it, it gets better with every viewing. I think I saw this, it might have been around the time I saw Ferris Bueller for the first time, but I was like a little kid, so I didn't really appreciate it back then. But now it, it definitely holds up, and it's gotten even better with the the repeat viewings that I've made in, in the past like decade. So it's- I agree. And yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I, was, I, I really love, too, about it that he um he's really a person who wants to explore but he ends up um doing something that becomes incredibly important that still i feel like speaks of today you know in terms of like the power that as we get online more and as things become um put more up into the responsibility to, of technology to handle and all the questions about AI, I think it it really is still so relevant. And I think why I love War Games so much is because it's such a well-made film that it it really takes the problem seriously that are actual real problems in the world. But I love that you know that there are also people behind it who are excited about the technology and excited to find ways to use it that are positive and I think that's what also kind of calls it a, like a war games you know like it, it they are actually playing war games in a very serious real world way but also like he's just playing a game and that a lot of the people behind technology like there's some where it's like um it's all gonna go down in flames and others like that are really have a very light spirit. I feel like, yeah. like David Lightman had who like, well, we can figure out how to use this technology in, in positive ways. Cause it doesn't end with them like blowing it all up. You know, it ends with um, just understanding how to use it. I think with a lot more intelligence. I think this movie um, should be shown at like military academies and with, you know, basically the military officials like it's a really scary reality that this movie insinuates you know so it would be like i think it's essential viewing for any you know soldier or person working uh at norad or any of these other um facilities uh because it's, this is a it's it's scary at you know the implications that this movie makes so i think that even just random high schools should you know air the you know screen this film because it's it's a very stark reality like it's really it's kind of scary you know but um i think they they did a very good job with this film and if you know if that's the if that's what can happen in, in you know 40 years ago then imagine what hackers can do now so i'm i don't want to give hackers any ideas but you know i, I think the military should uh, should definitely check this film out and and plan accordingly. So, you know, but um, I, I, I yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I I totally agree, and I think kind of the clo closest to war games might have been Silicon Valley, the TV series, <laughs> because they had a similar um, excitement spirit, and and they really none of those characters in there, even though. Um, you know, some of them were like anarchists. They also um, really wanted to create something. And I think that that's 
what makes war games still so relevant as well because you know he david didn't go in to destroy something he went in to create something and he wanted to you know be part of creating solutions i like in the end and i love in in war games when he saw you know that there was an issue he wasn't like oh yay you know i started the end of the world he was like oh my gosh you know we have to fix this yeah you yeah. know and, and he was a, a hero he he does he didn't want to destroy the world he he right. wanted to be part of of fixing it and so i i really would love to see more but i'm really kind of like okay we've seen enough of the dystopian i feel like i'd love to see more stories like that where they you know just want to save the day and kind of figure out how to use the technology and yeah. safer ways you know then um i feel like it kind of the dystopian let's it destroy everything has kind of taken over a little bit in in terms of like the hacker hero in my opinion it is it's definitely a, a depressing film so like the <laughs> The ideas that the, the movie uh, generates are depressing, but it does have a happy ending, so that's good. So let's let's keep those happy endings going. We need yeah. we need all of those. <laughs> all, you know, there we we yeah we need them more than ever. But I wanted to also talk about uh, real briefly uh, another movie that Matthew did uh, where it wasn't versus the machine; it was Matthew versus uh, monster, and this film is everyone i've talked to really does not like it very much and it is the 1998 uh, reboot of godzilla which was basically done by um it was directed by roland emmerich uh and screenplay was done by emmerich and dean devlin who are probably best known for their independence day movie uh, also stargate and just really like fun sci-fi action movies and Godzilla you know it's it's not a good movie but I think it has some really fun action sequences the the acting's atrocious uh even Broderick kind of I wasn't really impressed by his performance here um I, I guess he did his best but um you you've got uh, Jean Reno who plays this uh, French secret service agent you've got Hank Azaria Simpson Spain, uh, Birdcage, and um, Brockmire, I believe it's called. Uh, you also have Kevin Dunn and Michael Lerner, Harry Shearer, also Simpsons fame. There's also uh, the, I think her name is Nancy Cartwright. She was the voice of Bart. And she's in this too. So you've got three Simpsons uh, actors in here. So it's very strange. But I, you know, I, I revisited this film the other night. Uh, I had a, I actually had a lot of fun watching it. Uh, it's 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 you know it's not an intelligent movie. It's not a great movie, but like I said, the the action sequences are pretty on point. They're a lot of fun. Uh, the visual effects are okay uh, for the time. This is nineteen ninety eight, so you know they're not as polished as say you know uh, Jurassic Park or Lost World. But and this this movie definitely borrowed a lot from the Lost World in the uh, Madison Square Garden sequence with the uh, the baby Godzillas. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, Ivy, I'm I'm I you know I'm at a loss for words. W what did you think of uh, Godzilla? <laughs> <laughs> similarly, okay. yeah, similarly, I I agree. I I feel like it would be a really fun, like if you're want a fun like kids birthday party and you put it on like in the backyard and the visuals i think that's the only place it would be fun to have on you know they i think uh kids might find it really fun is like a big scary monster movie because there's actually like no blood it's not a gory movie which i think is cool in a sense that you can show it to you know kids who are who are old enough to see a you know big action monster movie like that um i think it would keep them very entertained um other than that um i agree i i also feel like you know godzilla i i just don't think it's right for to do an american remake of of godzilla 
<laughs> think it's in bad taste. Um, I, I think what would be so much better, I would have loved the movie if they did something like The Meg, where they weren't like the movie The Meg is such an obvious knockoff to yeah. Jaws, but because they don't call it Jaws, I <laughs> love it for what it is. It's like a ridiculous uh, movie about, you know, it's a fun, dumb movie yeah. about a giant um, shark. Right, right. And I feel like the, like I'm watching it, can, like thinking about the, you know, original Godzilla and, and like, how could you guys, how could you guys do this? But if they, <laughs> so I actually enjoyed it a lot more when I renamed it in my head to like the, the reptile. Right. And just saw it as just, you know, a movie that was a big reptile overtaking New York City um, and enjoyed it a lot more in in that way and um it's one of those funny movies too that's kind of fun to make fun of because there's so many things in it that are so lame you know like the what what they thought a new york city married couple would be like was i thought really funny <laughs> like random you know just like the hey gazara like hates his wife like that's his character <laughs> arc, you know it's like <laughs> and they kind of hate each other but they're stay married for in love like the, they're the new year couple you know and, the, and they, uh, like a lot of random stuff like that mm. uh, there's no character development they're they're like one dimensional um especially and especially uh, uh Mir maria patillo who plays uh matthew's um ex-girlfriend uh, she is just not a very good actress at all. I, I read on her uh, Wikipedia page that she's retired uh, with good reason, but no, maybe I just haven't seen the the best performance of hers. Uh, Godzilla is not it. Uh, I love Hank Azaria. Actually, I think Z Azaria might have been the highlight of the movie because he was pretty funny with his like you know the quintessential New Yorker accent. Um, so that was fun. Also. Um, I want to mention um, the score by uh, David Arnold, who is one of my favorite composers. He actually, he did Independence Day. He did Stargate. Uh, he's, he did a couple of the, the Pierce Brosnan, uh, James Bond films. I think he did one or two of the Cra uh, Daniel Craig Bond films as well. Great, great uh, uh, composer. He, he does action sequences very well. That's why I, I love the action sequences. Well, not love, but I like them a lot. I like the action sequences in Godzilla uh, mostly because of David Arnold's score. So if you guys are curious uh, about the score, if you're if you're film music aficionados, David Arnold, he I don't think I've ever heard of a bad David Arnold score. So I thought I'd, I'd say that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love I totally agree. I think the score is is one of the highlights of the movie. I think if you know, if if someone saw on their Spotify, you know, the Godzilla soundtrack, it's for good <laughs> reason. It's actually yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah. And I was, you know, I also think what's really interesting and in, like the, you know, the, the machine versus the monster and, you know, Matthew's character, he kind of have, he's a little bit similar in both. Like in Godzilla, he plays someone who, um, you know, he studies reptiles and he's studying the earthworm, um, the effect of radiation on right. earthworms. And oh, I, I actually really love Matthew so much because I feel like he does bring so much to his characters. They're such a funny and only murders in the building this season. <laughs> there's a really funny thing with Matthew Brod. It worth, really worth seeing of how seriously he takes creating his characters and I did feel that in Godzilla I felt like he took uh his character quite seriously I love how um his characters introduced is really adorable with him singing you know um singing in the rain and he's very cute in it and um I but I also feel like what's really great about that kind of character in um war games is like you, you want this sweet guy I feel like behind you know this act that was you know really dangerous but in here he 
is kind of like the sweet um, scientist, you know, who um, kind of sees, you know, what's really going on. And I, I felt like he just kind of was very typecast. Like there, what I really didn't like about this Godzilla is what it felt like was like bread, like, like really like wonder bread. Like they had taken something and like taken all the nutrients and all the, <laughs> it made it so bland. And then they had to like force so much back in the, right. to try to make it interesting. Like they had to force back in this kind of dopey, um, this guy who was like, I don't know why I'm here. And um, <laughs> they forced in a weird love story um, between him and the his ex-girlfriend who wants to be a reporter. And um, yeah. I, I just felt like they were, because they really shouldn't have been making it anyway. Um, they really um, tried to just jam it with as much like made up interesting stuff as possible which yeah. I feel like if it honestly wasn't even made, like it didn't really have to even be made because they weren't really referencing much of the original material anyway. So um, I just feel like I, I love a big monster movie so much. And so I feel like on an, if I just pretend it's not Godzilla, then it's yeah. a fun watch, but it is like quite offensive. <laughs> to yeah. the whole uh history of godzilla to even have been made we totally agree with that as it being an insult to the original films it's just a sloppy movie and it could have used a, a much better script some more tightening um they could have trimmed it a little in terms of some of the sequences some of the scenes uh the visual effects were okay that could have been also uh, improved upon i say if you want a good godzilla movie just see cloverfield because that is one of my favorite giant monster attacking Manhattan movies. Um, but yes, but with Broderick in both movies, in this and War Games, he is one of the first actors who made characters, who made nerds cool. Like, like you know, the whole idea of a nerd that can be cool. Uh, I think it was, it first came up in like the 80s with the John Hughes films, especially Ferris Bueller. And then obviously later on with... Um, with uh, the Big Bang Theory and stuff like that. So yeah, basically, yeah. Matthew Broderick has has made nerds cool. So there you go. And speaking like speaking of, of cool nerds and all fun stuff nerd-wise, New York Comic Con is this weekend, uh, Ivy. I, I know you know. Yes. Those listening, those watching, uh, New York Comic Con will be this Thursday through Sunday at the Jacob Javits Center in Manhattan. And I will be there uh, Saturday and Sunday with my Ghostbusters brethren. We will have our patented slime lab for the kids and the adults. So if you want to stop by, uh, we have we will have our table set up. And if you want to make some slime, have some fun with us, pose for some photos, uh, we'll be there all weekend. And I'll be there uh, Saturday, Sunday, but it runs Thursday through Sunday. Uh, Ivy, uh, I believe you're uh, you'll be in attendance. <laughs> oh my gosh, completely! It's uh, <laughs> my a, a religious event of the year, <laughs> so I must attend. I I wouldn't miss it. It's one of the greatest places in the whole world. <laughs> Is there anything in particular you're looking forward to, or just a casual, just go there and just absorb it all? definitely go there absorb it all I, i'll definitely check out you guys with the slime lab that sounds so fun um i last year um got to see jamie lake curtis um being interviewed about the last halloween that was a huge highlight from last year um so this year um the same like i mean i definitely like just crash landing and just seeing out of what unfolds and what I can get into. If I plan it too much, I get stressed out because it's so crowded oh. that I feel like if I get too attached to, to something and then I don't see it, it kind of ruins my whole day. So I've learned to cope with that by having no plan. <laughs> okay, I like that. No, <laughs> Same here. I, I kind of go in cold uh, when I'm not uh, manning the booth at uh, for the Ghostbusters. 
I like to just walk around, wander, see where uh, where the, the mood takes me. Uh, try not to spend too much money because <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's tempting. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a huge action figure and movie poster guy, so I'm gonna try to uh, refrain from uh, opening up my wallet uh, and just you know walk around, uh, take some photos with some cool cosplayers, uh, run into some some old friends, maybe make some new friends, uh, and. Yeah, it's just an exciting uh, four days, uh, and it's just it's just a yearly tradition. It really is a holiday, a, a, and like you said, Ivy, a, a religious experience, a religious holiday. <laughs> so, I totally one hundred percent agree with you there. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to running into you there. That, that should be a lot of fun. Yeah, you yeah. too. You and my favorite thing there, I think, is the. Um, cosplay fashion show or the con the have you seen that it's so um, incredible i think i saw some of that they, they they do that at other cons too and uh there's like a i think there's a prize for the best cosplay and uh that should be interesting are, are you going to dress up yourself i think so yeah i'm trying to decide on who i want to go as there's so many incredible characters I'm not sure yet who's gonna I'm gonna end up landing on, but um, I'm excited to see just the creativity. You know, I I just feel like when I ever I see the fashion, um, I just cry actually because just to seeing people's creativity <laughs> moves wow. me because um, they just you know um, ha found something in this character that affected them so much that they just built this entire kind of um costume and representation of them you know from scratch just I love when they talk like how the person built it like you can't just go to the store and you know Halloween adventures and buy it you have to build yeah. everything of it and just watching people's creativity is um really something to see like I I would recommend if people weren't even into necessarily the other things just that alone is really exciting to see what people come up with people they definitely bring out the gun the their the big guns with the creativity um even within the ghostbusters community there are some guys that like they are super detail oriented it has to be very very specific there has to be a scratch on the proton pack uh quarter of an inch uh, to the to the left, up a little bit, you know, they have to make it screen accurate. There's some there's some uh, the people that take it extremely seriously. I mean, not not to say that I don't take it seriously, but not to the level with some of these guys. But um, you know, it's it's a very important thing. Cosplay is a uh, it's it's an art uh, and a science. So there you go. All righty. So Ivy, are there any uh, plugs for you? Anything you want to mention? Any projects? Sure. Um, I'll just mention my Instagram is at my name at Ivy Lofberg, and I do something called Film Remedy, where I have a monthly theme, and then um, I post films that relate to that theme. For October, it's uh, Dancing in the Dark, so it's all films um, on that theme, and I write little uh, reviews and give re recommendations of fun stuff to see for the month. Uh, as for me, uh, if you want to catch new episodes of Under the Radar, so we are on, you can catch a video of the show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. Also, feel free to subscribe to the Under the Radar YouTube channel, uh, subscribe and share, spread the love. Also, of course, uh, you can listen to episodes of Under the Radar on Sirius XM through Slam Radio. That's channel 145. Uh, and that is every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, also, the show appears on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So tune in for that. Ivy, I want to thank you, as always, uh, for your, your attendance here. For your appearance is always uh, very special. And uh, I'm really uh, fortunate to know you and to have you on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Randy. I always love coming on you're such an excellent host and this is always <laughs> such a pleasure thank you so much thank you you're welcome anytime 
And I think I'll be seeing you soon uh, for future episodes. Uh, but before then, I will definitely see you at uh, New York Comic Con and possibly at the next Spoons, Tunes, and Booze. So Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, I'm Randy Younger. This has been Under the Radar, bringing movies and people together one frame at a time. We'll see you next time. Take care. Under the Radar is brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a two to match your attitude. Patent pending interchange genuine gemstone and crystal EMF protection jewelry. For more information, please visit magnitudejewelry.com slash gemgirl or call 718-268-6634. Randy Younger here at the Film Forum in New York City, and you're watching Under the Radar. This, this is my family. Thanks for the great day. And I'm telling you now, nobody messes with my family. <laughs> Master of your own destiny, Ricky. You up for that? Yeah. This is where it's at. Vindaloo. Gotta be hard to take this stuff, do you know what I mean? So I'm for it, then. Luckily now. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, Randy Younger here, Under the Radar, here with screenwriter Paul Laverty of the new drama, Sorry We Missed You. Uh, Paul, this film is phenomenal. It's terrific. Everything about it, especially the actors. Uh, how did this film come about? Um, well, I suppose... We, we did a film previous to this, a film called I, Daniel Blake, mm -hmm. that did very well in Cannes, it won the Palme d'Or, uh, directed by Ken Loach as well. And um, and in the process of doing that last film, we went a lot to a lot of food banks, I don't know if you have them here in the States, where people can't get to the end of the month, they can't buy all their food. Mm -hmm. And um, and what we noticed was, there was not just the unemployed, the people who were sick who were coming, but the working poor. Mm -hmm. So it really made us look at the gig economy, Mm. and precarious work and what we found out was that lots of people were working sometimes a couple were working but they still not have enough money to get to the end of the month so we started really beginning to look at this and I, I know you have something here called zero hour contracts mm. but it means that you know people get a couple of hours in the morning like carers who are looking after older people right. then there'll be a fallow periods where they don't get paid they don't even get the paid their travelling money mm. and then they would get a couple of hours at lunchtime another space and then they would get um, tuck-ins and looking after people with their medical needs and giving them medicines and washing them in, in the evening. So their whole working day was stretched out, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't get paid for all those hours. <laughs> and so there was kind of great poverty. And we also looked at the, the gig economy, mm -hmm. couriers, drivers, the white van men, the people who work for Amazon, for example, okay. those types of people. And what we found out there too was that they were tied to an app tied to an algorithm, mm -hmm. tied to the, I don't know what you call them, but the scanners or the, yeah. or the guns, right. the way we call them. Hmm. And um, and every moment of their working life was monitored, pressurised. you know. And what we really, really saw was just people under enormous pressure. So it really made us think, well, how does that affect a family? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if you're out of the house for so long, many of these people out of the house for 14 hours, right. who looks after the children? What happens to the children? Right. So we decided to tell a story about the Turner family. I mean, imagine Chris, who's a, a courier driver, mm -hmm. um, Abby, who's a carer, looks after older people, a 16-year-old son, Seb, and uh, and and the young and the young girl called called Katie, mm -hmm. and um, and so we just try to imagine their lives, humanize it. Yes, humanize it exactly, and just see how all that unravels in one life. And what we've found actually is had a tremendous resonance around the world, mm -hmm. you know, from Japan to Europe, you know, France has been very, very strong. And what we've found is that there are more and more people working harder and longer under more controlled conditions, mm -hmm. 
uh, receiving less benefits. And I think it really taps into the great elephant in the sitting room just now is massive inequality in our societies. And I know that there's a very, very important issue here in the United States where we have three men, Mr. Jeff Bezos, Mr. Warren Buffett, <laughs> and Mr. Bill Gates, who three white men who between them own the same as 50% of the American population, which is, it sounds like fiction, it sounds like something from <laughs> outer space, but it's the truth. Wish it were fiction. <laughs> yes, and, um, and it's not an accident because... We had Thatcher, you know, many years ago, who mm. destroyed the trade union movement, mm. and you had Reagan, and trade unions have got, you know, less and less strong, uh, corporations have got stronger, they've managed to organise a system whereby, you know, um, the, with deregulation, mm. they've managed to transfer all risk from the corporation to the individual driver okay. or the individual worker. So they don't get paid for they don't get paid for holiday money, mm. if there's no sickness benefit. So everything is left in the hands of the worker by themselves, atomized and fragile. And it's fine if everything goes well, but as soon as something goes wrong, yeah. they carry the brunt of it. Well, I can tell you you're very passionate about this this subject. Um, I'm curious, how long have you been thinking about this? How long have you been, you know, thinking of a story to come to film based on this sub this subject? Uh, well, I suppose. W our last film, Daniel Blake, is a companion piece to this film, and it looked at the world of welfare and how the poor are stereotyped and demonised. Mm. And I know this happens here, as if to say, well, it's all your fault. <laughs> and we have a very punitive, cruel system in the United Kingdom, mm. and I suspect it's not much kinder here. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we've been thinking about these issues and these and and, and listening to people who have who have lived through these um, experiences you know, for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very satisfying to bring it here to the Film Forum tonight, yeah. to have an opening tonight in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very lucky to get, you know, very strong reviews from, um, you know, uh, the New York Times and, mm -hmm. and, um, and various other magazines. So we know it's very hard to get a film like this out in the United States. You know, we're competing with big blockbusters. Our, our films have got a very modest budget. But I hope people will find a very intimate story but just by telling an intimate story in the north of England, mm. it's actually something that resonates with people's experiences around the world. Mm. We have the Amazons of this world everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, this consumer society where people are turned into cogs in a wheel, right. uh, where people are driven, where people are monitored and measured um, to the very last drop of sweat. <laughs> and we're really asking big, big questions about what is the point of work right. you know, if we can't look after our own children. And it's, the film is very intense um, because of the subject matter, uh, because of what the characters go through, obviously. Um, speaking about the characters, uh, mm. what was the casting process like? Did you work closely with Ken on that? Yes, we worked, well, Ken and myself have worked together now for the last 25 years. I think we've done 13 feature films together. Mm. Uh, we, did a, we did one here in the States a long, long time ago called Bread and Roses. Mm. Uh, about the Justice for Janitors strike, you know, si se puede, yes we can, you okay. know, way, way back, which Obama stole actually from the, from the janitors. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, uh, uh, yes we can, yes, mm -hmm. uh, si se puede, I met some fantastic people there. So we've been working together for a very, very long time, Brilliant. and um, so we work hand in hand. So Ken is a director, I'm a writer, but we meet in the middle as filmmakers, mm -hmm. and we try and support each other through the whole process, you know, right from the very talking about it, thinking about it, mm -hmm. you know, I write the script, Ken will... Uh, cast an eye over it and he's a very collaborative and a very demanding collaborator mm. but a very generous one mm. and then we do the casting together with a wonderful um, um, Scottish um, director uh, mm. casting director called Callan Crawford and, uh, and then we try and you know then we try and just find the best people and imagine the, <laughs> you know trying to find the people you will give life to the film as best imagined and what's lovely about it is those these two kids you know mm -hmm. uh, Katie and Reese. I'd never acted before, but they were actually brilliant. They are. Um, um, Debbie was actually, um, she was a, a, an assistant in a school for kids who get problems. So oh. she had a, a real brilliant hand with people, incredibly kind Very people. Very natural. And uh, Chris had done a little bit of acting, but he also had, he was a plumber hmm. and ran his own business and had a white van. So he brought, he brought that to the role. Yes, and uh, <laughs> I think you can, you know, you can see him there. He, he looks like a man who's been... He's been running a lot, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think you believe them as a family. I think, oh, yeah. I think that's been really, really nice about the reaction to the film. <laughs> People actually really believe this is a, they believe this is a family, <laughs> and we, and uh, the intricate relationships that they have. <clears throat> um, I'm curious. You've you've done a lot of writing yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is there a type of film that you'd like to write that you haven't written already? <laughs> well, um, well, 
each each story in each film really is a is it always feels like climbing a mountain because mm-hmm. you don't want to repeat yourself, right? You know, so um, it's always I find it's a massive effort, and and mm-hmm. we don't want to repeat ourselves, um, and we try and cover different things. So each each project feels enormous. So we take it one step at a time, and, and let's hope we can keep our marbles <laughs> and don't go crazy, and, and can get around to doing another one. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I love working with Ken Loach. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken is now eighty three, but still full of great energy and great. Uh, brilliant and he's smart and I work with a fantastic um, uh, Spanish director called Thier Boyain hmm. um, and we've done three films together as well so okay. we're, we're, I'm very lucky to work with two brilliant directors okay. how, how important is collaboration to you working with a team and bring a, a work of art such as this film to life how important is that, uh, that sense of teamwork it's absolutely key and, and very very important um, so we're very very lucky to work with some Really brilliant collaborators. Robbie Ryan is the director of photography. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Morris, uh, who is our editor, has edited films with Ken for about the last 40 years. Ray Beckett does sound, who, who won an Oscar a couple of years back for, for a film he did in the States. Um, and uh, Rebecca O'Brien is another key figure. Mm-hmm. In the, you know, the, we, we work together all the time. Ken Loach, the director. Rebecca O'Brien, who's a brilliant producer. And she does all the, the hard work in the engine room to make sure we can get time to, to dig around and do the do this do this do this work. So um, um, it's a brilliant team and mm-hmm. very very privileged to work with them. We write films that. What's very important for us is to maintain control of the content. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely key. So if you keep the budget low enough and everybody gets their money back, in essence, people. Um, mm-hmm we can decide the content mm-hmm. and uh, we don't want you know rich financial executives mm-hmm. you know telling us what to do and what to take out mm-hmm. so we're very very lucky to have our independence and I know that's very very difficult now in these days mm-hmm. but that is actually key to how we operate and of course is why we try to make these films right. but that is very very important to us so if you keep the I mean these films are are very modest by comparison you know probably mm-hmm. cost three or four million mm-hmm. you know whereas something like you know, the recent film from the UK in 1917 I think had a budget of 90 <laughs> yeah. million dollars you know, yeah. so it's like a they're different beasts altogether right <clears throat> okay um, now I understand you're also a lawyer um, uh, I you, used to be used to be yes uh, it's a long time ago and okay. I managed to escape law managed, <laughs> managed to escape the office which is probably a relief for for everyone okay yeah uh, back then though I'm curious did yeah. your did your law your lawyer life ever coincide with your screenwriter life um, well, I did work a long time ago as a human rights lawyer in mm. Nicaragua in Central America. I was an eyewitness to the to the war in Nicaragua, where the United States, via the CIA, mm. trained the Contra, right. who went in to try and undermine and destroy the, the Sandinista Revolution, which was in 1979. Mm. And so I was an eyewitness to the barbarity and the great shame that the United States um, tax dollars were used to penalise a civilian population. Okay. Um, it's long forgotten, and um, so I'm used to fake news. Fake news was uh, long before Trump came along, <laughs> and uh, what we saw was this tiny little country destroyed. And the great pity, of course, is I think that the Sandinista Revolution has actually been, um, you know, has been betrayed by the people who are in power just now, um, mm. who were very much involved at the beginning. But that's a, a long, long story and takes a great deal of untangling. But I, I suppose my my work there as as a lawyer bled into my first um, attempts to try and write a screenplay okay. because the first screenplay was set in Nicaragua called Carla Song mm. and uh, again directed by, by Ken Loach. Mm. Yep. Okay. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, are there, are there any other, mm. are there any uh, writer influence, uh, influences in your life? Any other writers that have influenced your, or impacted your work? Eh, well, that's very hard to say. <laughs> I think when you're writing you can have drawn everything you've ever read and mm you've ever been inspired by but if you think you try to copy another writer I think you're dead really right, right, I think right. you have to be kind of truthful to your instinct and mm. in the material and the people you're collaborating with you know you just can't simply copy someone right. uh, but obviously you're you know there's writers that you know, inspire you mostly novelists mm-hmm. you know but it's good it's, it doesn't really coincide with our filmmaking but although you'd um, you know it's a it's, it's a it's, it's, it's very different. I think you have to be truthful to your own voice and yeah. and try and tell original stories. I think you try to copy someone, you're dead. Right. Cultivate your own voice and just mm-hmm. bring it out creatively. Yeah, and, and give voice to the people that you've met, mm-hmm. you know, and shared their lives with us. You can't copy a screenplay from the street, mm-hmm. but you can certainly be, be inspired by them. 
you know, we did this, like I said, we did this film in the United States called Bread and Roses. That was inspired by, you know, fantastic, you know, immigrants who came in from Central America mm -hmm. and brilliant, fantastically uh, creative trade unionists, especially right. in the SEIU. And they organised this campaign called Justice for Janitors. Mm -hmm. And we met marvellously intelligent, uh, you know, creative trade unionists who are very brave and very principled. And I hope some of your viewers might get a chance to see the wonderful performances mm. uh, by these people in this film called Bread and Roses, Pane Roses. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, so film is a, is a fantastic medium. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, film is a perfect uh, conduit for change? Um, I think organising is the conduit for change. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's it's people only coming together and organising mm -hmm. collectively to confront corporate power in this country, which is just unbelievable just now. So um, <clears throat> I think f um, film is maybe a modest contribution, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's, uh, you hope a story can help raise some questions, raise some consciousness, right. but I have to remember that most films are actually right-wing and, and uh, at least in my, my experience, mostly right-wing and quite reactionary. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how, how many... You know who gets to choose what's up there? Who commissions the stories? Right. Who who occupies the the screen time and the screen space? Who gets the big giant budgets? You know. Yeah. You know, and it's it's usually let's face it, it's usually dramas of you know white men using violence to obtain their um, what they want. You know, mm. stereotyping them. You know, and, but uh, you know so. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes a film comes through the cracks that is that's subversive, mm -hmm. and and it's quite brilliant. Um, and uh, The Golden Cage is one that comes to mind, uh, hmm. written, done with a director called Diego Quemada. People get a chance to see that, hmm. you know, a film which is, you know, subversive and brilliant, hmm. but, you know, we'll never get the distribution and financing. Right. That. So The Golden Cage, try and, if your viewers yeah, can get yeah, a Yeah, yeah, I'm going to check that Yeah, out. check it out and, yeah. and just see <laughs> the wonderful cinematography in it. And it's a, a shame. And a brilliant story, yeah. Films like this, they're, <clears throat> they, they're, they're so important. They tell a real story, mm -hmm. and yet the budget's not that high. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I want to, you know, congratulate you and, and Ken and the whole team and cast mm -hmm. on what you've accomplished with this film. It's really, really moving. Well, thanks very much, um, because, you know, we set out to tell a great story. Mm -hmm. You know, you know you, a good issue doesn't make for a great film. Mm -hmm. You have to tell a great story. Yeah. And if you do tell a good story and the premise is right and it seems truthful and authentic mm -hmm. and has some echo mm -hmm. and it's got three dimensions to it, you know, there's a chance that it might echo in other people's lives and other cultures as well. Yeah. And uh, and so far we've been lucky. There seems to be, they've led to great debate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got a fantastic <laughs> distribution company in the UK called E1 mm -hmm. and they've organised community screenings. For the last film they organised something like 600 community screenings in churches and nice. trade union halls and schools and universities. And so there's be, the film has been used to debate and try to figure out how power okay. operates in our lives and try to figure out you know, why we have this massive concentration of wealth and power mm -hmm. and how that becomes organised. And it's no accident. Mm -hmm. And so if we are to confront that power we really have to use our imagination, we have to use our intelligence, mm. and we have to organise together yeah. and be in solidarity with each other. That's great. Mm. Uh, Paul, how can, uh, how can people see the film? Is it, when does it release? Um, well, I understand it uh, is released today. Okay. Uh, we're here at the Film Forum, speaking from the Film Forum in New York. I know it'll be here for, for two weeks. Mm. And then I think it, uh, it goes out through the country, you know, bit by bit. Okay. So um, I, I really don't have all the details, but I know it'll be here in the film forum for the next the next two weeks, and then it'll go throughout the country. I'm sure it'll be quite a modest distribution, but if people look up, sorry we missed you, mm -hmm. I'm sure the details will come up, I hope. <laughs> I hope so too. It's a great film. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for your pleasure. time. This thank is great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for your, uh, for your interest and, yeah. and, and, uh, and good luck, and thanks to your viewers for, for finding this on YouTube. Sure. Well, thank you again, mm -hmm. and I want to thank everyone watching at, at home and on your devices. Uh, this has been Unger the Radar. I'm your host, Randy Unger. Thanks so much for watching.